Welcome to the Learning Center's tutorial on preparing for the MCAT. This presentation is designed to give an overview of how to register for the MCAT, testing policies and procedures, and an overview of the test structure. Let's get started. Almost all medical schools in the United States and many in Canada require applicants to submit recent MCAT scores as part of their application and many health professions and graduate programs now accept MCAT scores in lieu of other standardized tests. The MCAT exam tests you on the skills and knowledge medical educators and physicians have identified as key prerequisites for success in medical school and in the practice of medicine. Content is divided into four multiple choice sections and is delivered as a computer-based exam. The MCAT exam does not contain a written portion or writing sample. The first three sections are organized around 10 foundational concepts or big ideas in the sciences and draw from the following disciplines in year-long introductory courses in biology, organic chemistry, general chemistry, and physics, and from first semester introductory courses in biochemistry, psychology, and sociology. Questions in these sections will ask you to combine your scientific knowledge from multiple disciplines with your scientific inquiry and reasoning skills. The final section, Critical Analysis and Reasoning Skills, includes questions that test your ability to comprehend and analyze what you read and requires no specific outside content knowledge. Each of the four sections of the exam includes some field test questions. These questions are being considered for future use and do not count towards your overall score. The chart below breaks down the various sections found within the MCAT. Let's take a moment to go over these sections which are non-content related. The first one is the examinee agreement. At the time of registration and on test day, you will be asked to confirm that you have read, understood, and agreed to comply with the policies and procedures contained within the MCAT Essentials. If you are a returning examinee, you must read the MCAT Essentials guide associated with your new registration. The MCAT Essentials is subject to change. The addition applicable to you is the version in effect at the time of the registration. At the beginning of the exam, if your timer expires before you accept the examinee agreement, your test will shut down and may not be restarted. The tutorial section. This is an optional overview of how the test will work. If this is your first time taking the exam, it would be beneficial to use this section to make sure you are completely familiar with the process. Optional breaks. This means you can go on to the next section in the MCAT if you finish the previous section early or if you want to skip one of the optional breaks. The remaining time from a section you finished early or a skip break will not carry over to the next section of the exam. Void question. This is where you decide if you want to void the scores. Satisfaction survey. This is an optional opportunity to give feedback. Later on in this overview, we will look more in depth at each of the sections of the test. It is essential, though, to take note of the length of the test and time for breaks in between. When preparing for the test, it will be important to work on preparing your stamina to be able to take the seven and a half hour test. Before you register, it is important to determine eligibility. You may sit for the exam if you are preparing to apply to and attend a health profession school. At the time of registration, you will be required to agree to a statement verifying that you are taking the exam solely for the purpose of applying to and attending a health profession school. If you are not intending to apply to and attend a health profession school, or if you are a currently enrolled medical student, you must obtain special permission to register for the exam. You must also obtain special permission if you are unable to comply with all AAMC testing procedures and if the inability is unrelated to a medical condition or disability. For a list of medical conditions and disabilities, please visit the AAMC's website to find out more information about testing with accommodations. Failure to obtain special permissions may result in, among other consequences, an investigation by the AAMC, registration cancellation, and slash or a ban from taking the MCAT exam for a designated period of time or permanently. The AAMC reserves the right to send a letter of inquiry regarding any individual who is or who has previously registered to take the MCAT exam to explain his or her purpose for taking the exam and to confirm that she slash he meets or meet the eligibility requirements. 
failure to fully cooperate with the AAMC's request, which includes, but is not limited to, responding in the time period specified and answering truthfully and accurately, may result in resignation cancellation, a ban from taking the MCAT exam for a designated period of time or permanently, or other consequences. Letters of inquiry will be sent to registrants via email. It is the registrant's responsibility to ensure that he or she registers for the MCAT exam with an email address that the registrant checks frequently. You will need an AAMC ID and an associated username and password to register for the MCAT exam. If you have previously created an AAMC ID at any time or for any reason, which includes creating an AAMC ID to access other products and services such as the AAMC practice test, medical school admission requirement database, fee assistance program, or AMCAS application, you must use that username and password when registering for the MCAT exam. If you do not have an existing AAMC ID, you will be directed to create an account and establish a username and password when entering the MCAT scheduling and registration system. Be very careful to enter your first and last name in the MCAT scheduling and registration system exactly the way they appear on the qualifying ID you will use on test day. If you do not provide the proper identification or your registered name does not match your qualifying ID, you will be considered a no-show, you will not receive a refund, and the registration will count toward one of your lifetime testing limits. First and last name on account and ID should match. If two last names on the ID, then both should be on the account. It is important to note, if your middle name appears on the same line as your first name, you may separate out your names as necessary between the first name and the middle name fields. Middle initials and or names are not required and will not be verified on test day. For more information, please contact the AAMC services. If you cannot remember your username or password, do not create a new AAMC ID. The login page provides options to reset your password or request your username. If you are still having problems, no longer have access to the email account that is registered, or encounter problems with the self-service security questions, please contact AAMC services. The following are violations of the AAMC's registration rules that may result in the registration or score cancellation suspension of registration eligibility, and slash or an investigation by the AAMC. Failure to follow registration rules may create identity validation or verification issues, the potential for mistakes in the assignment of score results, and other system disruptions. If you have a disability or medical condition that you believe requires an adjustment to standard testing conditions, you are encouraged to apply for testing accommodations. A decision on most requests will be made within 60 days of receipt of a complete application. All initial applicants for accommodations must be submitted electronically via the MCAT Accommodations online system on their website. You should submit your application far enough in advance to allow them time to review re your request and confirm any approved accommodations on your test day. Please visit their website for more inf information on application types and submission timeframes. You must be approved for accommodations no later than the silver zone deadline associated with your test date to allow them time to prepare and implement any approved accommodations. If you have not received a response by the silver zone deadline, you may test under standard conditions or reschedule to a later test date. Applicable rescheduling fees apply. You are encouraged to register for your preferred test date as soon as possible to increase the likelihood of testing in a convenient location on your preferred test date. For detailed information about the accommodations, application, and registration processes, please visit the MCAT exam with accommodations page on the MCAT website. For more information about changing test dates, canceling, or refunds, please visit the AAMC website. The chart below describes the scheduling zone and fee structure. There are three scheduling zones for each exam date gold, silver, and bronze. For each exam date, gold zone scheduling fees are lower and flexibility is higher. Fees are higher and flexibility is limited in the bronze zone. Here is an example of test dates for 2018. To determine the test dates available, please visit the AAMC website. The day before your test, there are a few things that you can do to make sure you're adequately prepared to be successful. Number one, Know the time zone your test center adheres to, especially if you're crossing a state or county line. It may be different from what you expect. For example, 
Daylight savings time is not adhered to by all U.S. states. Number two, make sure you have the current address of your test center, which is available on the NCAT scheduling and registration system. On rare occasions, a test center may change its address. If such an address change occurs, the AAMC or Promatic will make every effort to email you or call you before the test date. Number three, if you have registered for a to-be-determined TBD location, your final testing location will be communicated via email and updated on the MCAT scheduling and registration system at least three weeks or 21 days prior to your exam day. It is best to plan ahead by locating the center prior to test day. You won't be allowed to enter the testing room, but you will know how to get there as well as how long it'll take. Only those examinees whose identity can be verified through qualifying forms will be admitted. Typically, a driver's license or passport will meet the acceptable criteria noted below. As mentioned before, if you do not provide the proper identification, you will be considered a no-show, you will not receive a refund, and the attempt to test will count toward your testing limits. It is important to note you will be asked to duplicate your signature on test day. If your ID has the word temporary printed on it, Due to your current status within the country, you must contact AAMC services for instructions prior to the Silver Zone registration deadline associated with your test. It is your responsibility to obtain and present a qualifying form of identification to the TCA. If your identification will expire before your scheduled test date, you are responsible for obtaining an updated ID prior to your exam. If your ID has expired and you will not receive a new acceptable ID prior to exam day, you must reschedule your exam to a later administration or risk that your new ID will not arrive in time. Examinees must account for the processing time of government agencies when selecting an exam date. Please report to the test center at least 30 minutes prior to your start time in order to be admitted to the exam. The test center administrator will begin checking in examinees 30 minutes before the confirmed start time. If you arrive earlier than 30 minutes, do not be alarmed if the test center is not yet open. The only personal items you may bring into the testing room are your ID and a pair of foam wireless earplugs sealed and inspected by the test center administrator. You will be provided with a storage key, scratch paper, and pencils. No other items are permitted unless approved by the AAMC. All other personal items, including jewelry, must be stowed in the provided secure storage unless authorized by the AAMC prior to your test date. The AAMC recommends that you bring as few personal items as possible to the test center on the test day. Neither the AAMC nor Prometric will be responsible for lost or stolen items. You will be scanned with a metal detector wand when you enter into the testing room, as well as each time you re-enter the testing room, i.e. following breaks. If you refuse, you may not be allowed to test. Due to volume and check-in procedures, actual starting times will vary by individual. On rare occasions, Wait times may extend past one hour. Here are a few rules to look forward to on the day of your test. You will be assigned a seat once you enter the testing center and the seat cannot be changed. Make sure to follow all of the directions given by the testing staff and raise your hand if you have any questions. Finally, you will be given a scratch piece of paper for note taking. Below are additional rules regarding breaks and security. Aggressive, disruptive, or uncooperative examinees will be asked to leave and will not receive a refund. On the day of the test, make sure to come prepared for the varying temperatures in the room as well as dress comfortably. If for any reason you need to remove a clothing item, i.e. a sweater, you will be instructed to either place it outside the testing area or in the back of your chair. Keep in mind that the exam clock will not be stopped. On test day, you have the option to void your MCAT exam if you do not wish for your test to be scored. Information from voided exams is not included on any score reports that are sent to medical schools. However, indication of a voided exam will be displayed in the MCAT score reporting system after the scheduled score release date for you to see. A voided exam does not count towards your testing limits. Regardless of the reason you choose to void your exam, you must wait at least 48 hours from the original test date and time to register for a new test date. Voiding an exam is not grounds for a refund. If you must leave due to illness or other unforeseen circumstances and have not started every section, the AAMC may void your scores for you if you submit a test center concern. 
The scores from each of these four sections will be converted to a scaled score ranging from 118 lowest to 132 highest. For example, if your raw score on one of the sections is between 35 and 37, your converted score might be 123. Scores ranging from 46 to 48 might have a converted score of 128 and so forth. Test takers often ask if earning a higher score is easier or harder at different times of the test taking year. The question is based on an assumption that the exam is scored on a curve and that a final score is dependent on how an individual performed in comparison to other test takers from the same test day or same time of year. A wrong answer will be scored exactly the same as an unanswered question. There is no additional penalty for wrong answers, so even if you are unsure of the correct answer to a question, you should make your best guess. While there may be small differences in the MCAT exam you took compared to another examinee, the scoring process accounts for these differences. For example, a 124 earned on the critical analysis and reasoning section of one exam means the same thing as a 124 earned on that section on any other exam. How you score on the MCAT exam is not reflective of the, of the particular exam you took, including the time of day, the test date, or the time of year since any difference in difficulty level is accounted for when calculating your scaled scores. See above for information about scaling. The percentile ranks provided on your scale report show the percentages of test takers who received the same scores or lower scores on the exam than you did. They show how your scores compared to the scores of other examinees. Every year on May 1st, the percentile ranks are updated using data from one or more testing years. These annual updates ensure that the percentile ranks reflect current and stable information about your scores. This means that changes in percentile ranks from one year to another reflect meaningful changes in the scores of examinees rather than year-to-year -year fluctuations. Updating percentile ranks is consistent with industry practice. If you're applying to medical school through the American Medical College Application Service, AMCAS, there is no extra step you need to take to insert your scores into the AMCAS application. Please note that medical schools want to see your entire testing history, which means that you cannot withhold current or prior scores from your AMCAS application. The AMCAT score reporting system is used to view your test scores and it can also be used to release your scores to institutions not participating in the AMCAS service. Through this system, you have the ability to print official score reports or send them electronically to whoever you wish. Recipients can verify official score reports online and there is no additional charge to examinees for use of this system. Per our full disclosure policy referred to in the previous section, all tests taken from April 2003 and beyond will be included in electronic score reports. This is why voiding scores is important. This is the only way to keep potentially bad scores from being sent slash seen by a university. If you wish to submit a score from a test taken prior to 2003, you must utilize the print score report capability. Please visit the AAMC website for up-to-date score release dates. Unlike some other entrance exams, there's a lifetime cap on the number of times you're able to retake the MCAT. Below are additional rules concerning retaking the MCAT. It is important to note that some schools weigh all sets of scores equally and note improvements. Other schools consider only the most recent set of scores. Others take an average of all sets of scores. And some schools only use the highest set of scores or the highest individual score sections. Make sure to check with your program. In order to start preparing for the MCAT, familiarize yourself with the test structure, rules, administration, scoring, and anything else that you might think may be important. Watching this video is a good first step. In the next few slides, we will go through each of the content areas in more depth. Read through an exam overview and a prep book. We have MCAT books at the Learning Center you can use for free. It's called the Academic Resource Library, which means the book has to stay in the office. At the bottom of this slide, you will see some other study resources to prepare for the MCAT. Here are additional options you can use for various target areas. 
Roadmap to MCAT Content in Sociology and Psychology Textbooks. Lists introductory psychology and sociology textbooks, many of which are open access that contain MCAT concepts and content. The publishers of these textbooks have identified where in their publications the MCAT content is located. AAMC Content Outlines. This document from AAMC, the makers of the MCAT, provides an outline of the information you need to know for the exam in a handy dandy PDF. It breaks down each test section and gives a detailed list of what you need to know and what subject that knowledge falls under, physics, biochemistry, organic chemistry, etc. This is a very useful resource you can use to study more efficiently for the exam. Next Step Test Prep has free events throughout the year. They provide students and advisors with access to information on the test prep, admissions, and many other topics relevant to the pre-med community. They also have public office hour sessions about once a month. These sessions give students a preview of what their class students have access to. You have to make sure to register in advance. Use the Khan Academy MCAT collection to brush up on familiar topics or expose yourself to new materials not yet covered in your courses. This free and open access collection includes more than 1,100 videos and 3,000 review questions on all of the content areas the exam covers. You can customize how you study by digging deeper into the content categories on which you want to focus. Magoose is a great resource for preparation and practice, has lots of helpful articles on their blog, can search for specific content areas or questions, and also has different practice questions. In addition, the lecture workbook was created by two Magoosh course teachers, which is a good resource for studying and provides some practice questions. Magoosh also has a paid prep course, but you really can get a lot of their free resources if you create a structured plan for yourself. MCAT Resources is a nice page to all the links of all the resources on Magoosh. AAMC has lots of paid resources you could also look into. The price ranges anywhere from 10 to $238. You will probably be able to do just fine just utilizing free resources. Here are some other options. Kaplan MCAT QBank. Here is a link to 175 free MCAT practice questions from Kaplan. On the Kaplan website, you can also find a free question of the day, as well as some other free materials. Free MCAT practice questions. Kaplan's 20-minute workout. Don't have time for a full MCAT practice test, but still want to see how you might do if you took the MCAT today? You've come to the right place. With Kaplan's 20-minute workout, you can try your hand at a few sample MCAT questions to see where you stand. AAMC Mini Test eBook. This eBook from AAMC contains 12 practice questions and explanations that give a good idea of what the questions on the actual MCAT will be like. The best MCAT practice tests for score predictions are the two put out on the AAMC itself. They cost $35 each and are the only official diagnostic tests which give a scale score, therefore providing the best indication of what your score may be like. Our advice is to use a sample test to create your study plan and then when you're getting close to the test date, one to two weeks before, take practice exam one to see your likely scaled score. If it is not where you want it to be, you may want to consider pushing back your test date or seeking additional resources. After preparing more, you then have practice exam two still available to take to assess your progress. The following slides provide an overview of the entire MCAT exam in order by section. The chemical and physical foundations of biological systems section asks you to solve problems by combining your knowledge of chemical and physical foundational concepts with your scientific inquiry and reasoning skills. Concepts tested in this section are typically taught at many colleges and universities in introductory year-long courses in biology, organic chemistry, general chemistry, and physics, as well as in other first semester biochemistry courses. Most questions are organized around descriptive passages with multiple questions per passage. The other questions are not based on descriptive passages and are independent of each other. 35% of this section tests actual content knowledge. 45% tests scientific reasoning and problem solving, while 10% tests reasoning about design and execution of reach, and 10% tests database statistical reasoning. 
The content tested is shared in order of frequency to help you in making your study plan. It would be most beneficial for you to build your weaker areas that are more prevalent. So for example, if you take a practice test and find that you're weakest in biology and chemistry, it would make the most sense for you to work on studying and practicing chemistry first. Since introductory biology is only 5% of the questions, it might make sense to leave that until the very end of your studying for that section, even if you are weak. These percentages have been approximated to the nearest 5% and will vary from one test to another for a variety of reasons. These reasons include, but are not limited to, controlling for question difficulty, using groups of questions that depend on a single passage, and using unscored field test questions on each test. Below, you will see a list of basic math concepts that you should be familiar with for the MCAT. You should note that the understanding of calculus is not required. The next three slides provide brief lists of the concepts covered in the various areas of the MCAT. For further information, utilize the studying and practice resources previously shared in this presentation. As you may notice, this slide contains various general and organic chemistry concepts to review that include, but are not limited to, solubility, atomic nucleus, electrochemistry, and lipids. Here is a brief list of physics concepts to review. Below, you will find a passage from the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. Take a couple of minutes and review the information and then answer the question on the next slide. The question related to this example reads, the progress of reaction two can be monitored by observing what change in the IR spectrum of the product mixture. The correct answer is C. This question requires a test taker to combine knowledge about infrared spectroscopy with reasoning about the structural differences between the products and the reactions of reaction two. The test taker must work with the scientific model of the differences of IR absorbances of various functional groups and apply this model to the experiment described in the passage. Recognition of the presence of additional carbonyl groups in the products of the reaction should lead the test taker to conclude that appearance of the peak between 1700 and 1750 centimeters in the IR spectrum would provide the most effective way to monitor product formation. The question related to this example reads, the following kinetic parameters were obtained for the IDO catalyzed oxidation of compound 3 by H2O2 in the presence of LTRP. Based on this data, what effect does LTRP have on the reaction? The correct answer is D. This question requires a test taker to combine knowledge of enzyme kinetics with interpretation of data. The test taker must understand what the decreasing values of KCAT in the presence of higher concentrations of LTRP mean with respect to the kinetics of IDO catalyzed indole oxidation. The KCAT is representative of the rate of product turnover, which means that the enzyme produces less product in the presence of LTRP. Combining this trend in the data with the knowledge of enzyme kinetics, it can be concluded that LTRP is inhibiting the reaction. The question related to this example reads, which experiment can be used to show that compound 6 is not formed sequentially from either compound 4 or compound 5? The correct answer is B. This question requires the test taker to apply knowledge about how enzymes catalyze reactions to the design of an experiment. The question asked how researchers can be sure that compound 6 is not formed from either compound 4 or compound 5 in a sequential enzyme mechanism. Enzymes are not used up during catalase, so any experiment that includes just compound 4 or just compound 5 would determine if either is also a substrate for IDO catalyzed conversion to compound 6. Having both compounds in solution with IDO adds unnecessary complexity to the interpretation of the experimental results. Examining the products of IDO catalyzed reduction of compound 6 would not give the necessary direct evidence, as compound 6 could be sequentially reduced to compound 3. This section will contain an overview of the critical analysis and reasoning skills portion. 
The critical analysis and reasoning skills section asks you to read and think about passages from a wide range of disciplines in the social sciences and humanities, followed by a series of questions that lead you through the process of comprehending, analyzing, and reasoning about the material you have read. Typically, there are nine passages while you have about one minute and 42 seconds per question. It is a good idea to practice giving yourself nine minutes per passage with an extra nine minutes of fudge room. The skills tested and passage types are shared in order of frequency to help you in making your study plan. It would be most beneficial for you to build your weaker areas that are more prevalent. So for example, if you take a practice test and find that you are weakest in reasoning within the text and reasoning beyond, it would make the most sense for you to work on studying and practicing reasoning beyond first. It is also best for you to practice critical reading skills on humanities and social science passages, not any other areas. Passages in the critical analysis and reasoning skills section are excerpted from the kind of books, journals, and magazines that college students are likely to read. Passages from the social sciences and humanities discipline might present interpretations, implications, or other applications of historical accounts, theories, observations, or trends of human society as a whole, specific population groups, or specific countries. Of these two passages, social sciences and humanities, social sciences passages tend to be more factual and scientific in tone. For example, a social science passage might discuss how basic psychological and sociological assumptions help scholars reconstruct patterns of prehistorical civilizations from ancient artifacts. Humanities passages often focus on the relationships between ideas and are more likely to be written in a conversational or opinionated style. Therefore, you should keep in mind the tone and word choice of the author in addition to the passage assertions themselves. Humanities passages might describe the ways art reflects historical or social changes or how the philosophy of ethics has adapted to prevailing technological changes. Below is a more in-depth look at what these three main areas specifically test. There are several things to keep in mind when approaching a critical analysis and reasoning skills section. The first read through is just to get a sense of the main idea and where things are discussed in the passage. On the first read through, number the paragraphs and write out a few words next to each number to remind you of the contents of each paragraph. Also, get a sense of the main idea of the passage on the first read through. You will be able to highlight words and passages on the computer based test. You will have 90 minutes on this section to answer 53 questions. Typically, there are nine passages with five to seven questions slash passage. Plan for nine minutes per passage, leaving a nine minute fudge factor. Save more time for the questions than the read through. Although the number of questions following each passage varies and the number of passages isn't required to be nine, it can be assumed you have roughly nine minutes per passage for the average test. Typically, a student will want to spend three to four minutes for the initial read through in order to save five to six minutes for the questions. When answering the questions, always refer back to the passage. Students that refer back to the passage rather than relying on memory consistently score higher on these sections. The first question associated with this passage reads, According to the passage, the decisive factor in determining whether someone's actions should be subject to coercion is whether the actions, the correct answer is B. The passage argument is not that all actions determined by self-interest should be regulated, only those actions in which the gain of one represents a loss to all and voluntary restraint is unlikely. Thus, option A is incorrect. Implicitly, coercion is needed to produce responsibility in circumstances to which the story of the commons applies, i.e., resources are held collectively so that self-interest compels each to increase his or her gain without limit in a world that is limited. Thus, option B is correct. The author implicitly favors coercion rather than the U.S. policy of laissez-faire in many issues affecting business, the environment, and the family. Therefore, Degradation of the natural environment, although among the issues affecting the public interest, would not be relevant criteria for e every decision about the need for coercion. Thus, option C is incorrect. 
The passage questions the assumption that decisions reached individually will collectively be the best decisions for society as a whole. This is a question of economic philosophy, not of personal morality. Thus, option D is incorrect. The second question associated with this passage reads, the passage argument suggests that national parks might benefit from, one, the restriction of recreational use by means of fees, two, the selling of this facility to private investors, three, the opening of additional facilities to the public. The correct answer is A. Since everyone has the right to use a public resource, pressure on the terrain and ecosystems of national parks increases as population increases. Therefore, these lands would benefit by the imposition of fees that reduce their use by the public, option one. Thus, option A is correct. The opening of additional park lands to the public, option three, might delay the day of reckoning, but only by exposing even more resources to the tragedy of the commons. According to the passage, the solution to the problem of overuse is not to enlarge the commons, but to abandon the commons concept. If resources to which the commons analogy currently apply became concessions for private investors, option two, changes in their use by the public might result. However, since the passage provides no analysis of the decision-making process involved in the wish of private owners to maximize personal gain, it does not justify a conclusion about the effect on parklands of privatization. The third question associated with this passage reads, some communities with expanding populations have for centuries successfully managed commonly held land. An appropriate clarification to the passage would be the stipulation that the author's argument applies only to. The correct answer is B. The past perfect tense of the commons concept has had to be abandoned indicates that the abandonment, even if continuing, occurred over an indefinite period in the past. Thus, option A is incorrect. Communities that manage commonly held land so that it was preserved despite an increasing population would necessarily have infringed on somebody's personal freedom, probably though through some form of coercion. To accommodate these cases, the author might appropriately qualify the statement that, as the human population increased, the commons concept has had to be abandoned in one aspect after another, with the stipulation that it applies only to unregulated resources. Thus, option B is correct. Although the premise of the question suggests social stability, it does not imply that such stability is necessary to the successful management of commonly held land or that only unstable communities are subject to the inherent logic of the commons. Thus, option C is incorrect. The passage author opposes assumptions about publicly held resources that are used to defend the U.S. policy of laissez-faire. That is, the problem addressed in the passage is a failure to manage these resources effectively whether on a local or a national level. Thus, option D is incorrect. At the end of this section, you will be given a mid-exam 30-minute break. As mentioned before, this is optional. If you choose not to use it, you can move on to the next section, but don't get those extra 30 minutes for the section. We recommend you take this break to eat lunch and prepare for the last part of the test. An overworked brain with little nutrition is a poor function in brain. This section will contain an overview of the biological and biochemical foundations of living systems portion. The biological and biochemical foundations of living systems section asks you to solve problems by combining your knowledge of biological and biochemical concepts with your scientific inquiry and reasoning skills. This section tests processes that are unique to living organisms, such as growing and reproducing, maintaining a constant internal environment, acquiring materials and energy, sensing and responding to environmental changes, and adapting. It also tests how cells and organ systems within an organism act independently and together to accomplish these processes, and it asks you to reason about these processes at various levels of biological organization within a living system. 35% of this section tests actual content knowledge, 45% test scientific reasoning and problem solving, while 10% test reasoning about design and execution of reach, and 10% test database statistical reasoning. This is the same as the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems section. The content tested is shared in order of prevalence in order to help you in making your study plan. 
it will be most beneficial for you to build your weaker areas that are more prevalent. So for example, if you take a practice test and find that you are weakest in biology and chemistry, it would make the most sense for you to work on studying and practicing biology first for this section. Since each of the chemistry is only 5% of the questions, it might make sense to leave that until the very end of your studying for this section, even if you are weak. These percentages have been approximated to the nearest 5% and will vary from one test to another for a variety of reasons. These reasons include, but are not limited to, controlling for question difficulty, using groups of questions that depend on a single passage, and using unscored field test questions on each test form. Like with the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems section, you will have access to the periodic table and need to know general math concepts previously shared. Here is a brief list of the concepts covered in these areas. For further information, utilize the studying and practice resources previously shared. Below you will find an additional brief list of the concepts covered in these areas. Here are additional chemistry concepts covered. Below is a passage example for the biological and biochemical foundations of living systems section. The following three slides will contain questions associated with this passage. Make sure to read through this passage carefully, making note of anything important. The first question associated with this passage reads, the researchers choose a concentration of 0.3 MMIAA as a working concentration for any additional studies instead of 1 mm or 2 mm. What is the likely reason for this? The correct answer is B. This question requires the test taker to apply knowledge about cytotoxicity and cell lysis to the design of an experiment described in this passage. In particular, the examinee should understand that conducting an experiment where the level of IAA was cytotoxic to the cells when compared to control conditions would not be desirable for understanding the role of glycolysis in establishing ion concentration gradients, as these cells would lose membrane integrity and undergo lysis. Therefore, the experimental design should not use an IAA concentration that results in significantly increased cell lysis. The second question associated with this passage reads, the information in the passage suggests that glycolysis? The correct answer is A. This question requires the test taker to apply knowledge about glycolysis to the experimental data from figure one. In particular, the trend in the data that shows increasing concentration of IAA results and a higher ratio to the concentration of sodium to potassium than observed in the control sample must be correlated with the role of IAA in the distribution of glycolysis. This is further supported by the drop in lactate production shown in figure one at higher concentrations of IAA because IAA prevents the formation of NADH, which is used when pyruvate is reduced to lactate. The combination of the proposed role of IAA and the results from figure one lead the test taker to the conclusion that glycolysis is important to the NAKA AT pace, the sodium pump, and therefore important to the maintenance of the concentration ratio of sodium to potassium. The third question associated with this passage reads, if the effects of IAA treatment and nerve cells are the same as those observed in myocytes, which feature of an action potential would be most affected by IAA treatment? The correct answer is D. This question requires a test taker to recall information about the role of the sodium pump in the recovery of the nerve cell resting potential after an action potential. In addition, the test taker must reason about the effect of IAA treatment based on the information presented in the passage and how the inhibition of glycolysis by IAA would affect the cellular concentration of ATP. Based on these two lines of reasoning, the test taker can propose a hypothesis about which portion of an action potential would be affected by IAA treatment. At the end of this section, you will be given a 10 minute break as mentioned before, this is optional. If you choose not to use it, you can move on to the next section, but you don't get those extra 10 minutes for this section. We recommend you take your breaks, though, as you don't want to end up losing time on a section because you need to stop for a bathroom break in the middle of a section. You cannot stop the time. This section will contain an overview of the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior portion. 
The Psychological, Social, and Biological Foundations of Behavior section asks you to solve problems by combining your knowledge of foundational concepts with your scientific inquiry and reasoning skills. This section tests your understanding of the ways psychological, social, and biological factors influence perceptions and reactions to the world, behavior and behavior change, what people think about themselves and others, the cultural and societal differences that influence well-being, and the relationships between societal stratification, access to resources, and well-being. The Psychological, Social, and Biological Foundations of Behavior section emphasizes concepts that tomorrow's doctors need to know in order to serve an increasingly diverse population and have a clear understanding of the impact of behavior on health. Further, it communicates the need for future physicians to be prepared to deal with the human and social issues of medicine. 35% of this section test actual content knowledge, 45% test scientific reasoning and problem solving, while 10% test reasoning about design and execution of reach, and 10% test database statistical reasoning. Please note that about 5% of this test section will include psychology questions that are biologically relevant. This is an addition to the discipline target of 5% for introductory biology specified for this section. So 5% of the 65% of psychology is biologically relevant psychology concepts. The content tested is shared in order of prevalence to help you in making your study plan. It will be most beneficial for you to build your weaker areas that are more prevalent. So for example, if you take a practice test and find that you are weakest in biology and psychology, it would make the most sense for you to work on studying and practicing psychology first. Since introductory biology is only 5-10% to 10 of the questions, it might make sense to leave that until the very end of your studying for this section, even if you are weak. These percentages have been approximated to the nearest 5% and will vary from one test to another for a variety of reasons. These reasons include, but are not limited to, controlling for question difficulty, using groups of questions that depend on a single passage, and using unscored field test questions on each test form. It will test some knowledge from the latest DSM that will be in an intro psychology class. In May 2013, the American Psychiatric Association published the fifth edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5, with revisions to the criteria for the diagnosis and classification of mental disorders. These revisions are reflected in the content list for the Psychological, Social, and Biological Foundations of Behavior, PSBB, section of the MCAT 2015 exam. Some of the revisions may not yet be reflected in the textbooks and curricula of bachelorette-level introductory psychology courses. There is a link to the chart which describes the differences between the previous DSM edition, DSM-4, and DSM-5. Note that this is not an exhaustive list of the changes made to the DSM. It is specifically tailored to the content of the PSBB Section 1. The PSBB Section will test these concepts as they are described in the DSM-5. Like with the other sections, you will have access to the periodic table and need to know general math concepts previously shared. Here is a brief list of the psychology concepts covered in these areas. For additional information, utilize the studying and practice resources previously shared. Here is a brief list of the sociology and biology concepts covered in these areas. For further information, utilize the studying and practice resources previously shared. Below is a passage example for the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior section. The following three slides will contain questions associated with this passage. Make sure to read through this passage carefully, making note of anything important. The first question associated with this passage reads, which statement best represents a threat to social identity? A young woman with a rare disorder? The correct answer is B. This psychology question assesses the knowledge of scientific concepts and principles, skills with the concept that is part of the content category of self-identity. Social identity addresses the feelings that individuals derive from or that are associated with their membership in a group. Self-esteem can be undermined by threats to social identity, which is represented in the correct answer, option B. The incorrect options do not clearly identify the connection between an individual's sense of self and their perceived membership in a group. 
The second question associated with this passage reads, over the course of 10 years, a rare disorder increases in prevalence such that it eventually affects more than 200,000 people in the United States. Based on the passage and the scenario, which prediction is most consistent with the sociological paradigm of symbolic interactionism? The correct answer is B. This is a sociology question that evaluates the skill of scientific reasoning and problem solving with a theoretical paradigm that is listed under the content category of understanding social structure. Symbolic interactionism focuses on how meaning is constructed through small-scale social interactions. As a concept that is relevant to social interactions and the illness experience, social stigma is also closely associated with symbolic interactionism. Thus, the correct answer is option B, which rests in reasoning from the perspective of symbolic interactionism to make a prediction about social interaction and stigmatization. The correct options make predictions about large-scale social changes or about the disease itself, which are not consistent with the paradigm of social interactionism. The third question associated with this passage reads, which research project best represents a macro sociological approach to studying the social support networks mentioned in the passage? The correct answer is D. This sociology question tests on reasoning about the design and execution of research with material that is covered by understanding social structure. Option D is the correct answer because tracking changes in websites would provide data on the availability, growth, or decline of information about rare disorders. This type of project is aligned with a macro sociological approach because it would allow a researcher to determine how the organization of health information in a society changes over time. The other options are incorrect because they are more similar to a micro sociological approach, as each would result in data that are based on small scale interactions or individual decisions. At the end of this section is the void question. This is where you decide if you want to void the scores. You have five minutes to make this decision, but you will not be given your scores. You will then be given an optional satisfaction survey. Thank you for following along with this video. Please make sure to check out the Learning Center and its academic resource library for additional tools on the MCAT. For additional information as well, please check out the AAMC website.